it is very troubling to me that so many even believers are approaching this issue and saying, yes, I know that candidate party, you know, fill in the blank. I know they support abortion. And yet look at the good that could be done. Welcome to the Reformed Reckoner on Eschatology Matters, part of the Fight, Laugh, Feast network and available on Boniface Media. Want to start reading the Puritans, but don't know where to begin? Well, then look to Puritan treasures for today from Reformation Heritage Books, which makes the riches of these godly writers of old accessible for the modern reader. With updated language and helpful introductions, classic works from John Owen, Jeremiah Burroughs, and more are the perfect starting points for the curious reader. Learn more about the Puritan Treasures for today at heritagebooks.org slash Puritan Treasures and enter co promo code EMATTERS for 10% off your whole order. So this week, wanted to dive into some interesting topics around the Shroud of Turin. There's been recent news articles and findings, some X-ray analysis saying that, nope, this Shroud of Turin is legitimately the burial cloth of Jesus. So before diving into all the different details of this, I want to guys get your thoughts on this. Uh, how should Christians think about it? Uh, should we think about its legitimacy? And then when it comes to its reverence and giving it some form of honor, how should we as Christians think about this? Do you want to hear something funny first, though? Shroud of Ter <laughs> I, I used to think when I first heard about this that it was somehow related to Torok, which was a game for the Nintendo 64, and I was really confused why everybody was always talking about this, like it somehow related to Jesus. Because I was like, no, that's dinosaurs. But it's not. Uh, people actually think that this is an image of Jesus, right? Uh, that has been, help me out with the signs of it. How did we get all of this? I know that there were like photo negatives and all of these other things that went into it. But yeah. So, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So the Shroud of Turin, just to high level, um, it is believed to be the burial cloth that's accounted for in the gospel stories that he was wrapped in the burial cloth, Joseph of Arimathea, and that uh, there seems to be a tradition that it was received, I believe, by maybe the apostles, uh, it's kind of dark in history until you get to the medieval ages, where then I think some knight is said to have had it, um, found it, or to now have it in the possession. And there's been a lot of studies on it, specifically starting like the 1800s, where they realized, oh, if you do like a reverse photography lighting on this, you could actually see the image of Jesus's appearance. And then they've done more studies. There seems to be blood samples, marks of the stigmata, you know, in his in his hands, in his feet, uh, injury in the side, blood, certain chemicals related to even torture. Um, so there's a lot of people that say, hey, this is legitimate. Um, one of the big findings was when they did carbon dating, it seemed to be around the like 1100s, 1200s. But I think there's now a new x-ray analysis that says, oh, no, this could be found during the time of Jesus. Yeah. Which, so that's kind of the high level of it. I, I love the fact that carbon dating has been called into question once more because I think there's a lot of a lot of hay to make there with with carbon dating methods. But, yeah, it's it, I think it's natural for Christians to have sort of a, a, a reticence with with things like the Shroud of Turin and its uh, its veracity or its historicity. So in, in general, you know, Christian history is kind of littered with relic uh worship oftentimes but if if nothing else just a preoccupation with relics and a um oftentimes veneration or trap people traveling to relics for various religious duties so that's kind of littered throughout christian history many uh, particularly within reform streams would have um, a lot of hesitancy theologically and also just anecdotally with those sort of things um but when you see something like the tra the, the the shroud of turin um i think that it can be encouraging for some believers to see something which may or may not have been around at the time of christ i think i, th I think there might might be a proper place for that. And we're going to walk through some of those tenant issues. But I think there's also an undue weight we can ascribe to those things. So I would compare this to, for example, the, uh, uh, I think it was called the Archaeology Study Bible, something like that. It was, you know, one of those study Bibles and it had, you know, archaeological findings. And uh, look, here's where we unearth some city that's mentioned in, in one of the biblical narratives of the Old Testament. Those are neat. Um, but what I what I worry with Christians sometimes is that we can see those things and say, because we found a stone or a rock wall somewhere, my faith has now been strengthened because I found this stone wall. And that could be a little bit of a tricky business for Christians. Um, and I think I think a lot of that hesitancy uh, plays into something like the Shroud of Turin, plus the fact that with relics, there was a lot of forgery. You know, the the, the typical story that's shared is. Um, I can't remember the source of this off the top of my head, but he was talking about if if they were to gather up all of the uh, splinters 
from the cross uh, that was used to crucify Christ. He said we could build like a thousand crosses because there was, you know, every church claimed to have a, a large splinter that was off of the cross. So a lot of just historical hesitancy with those sort of things. Well, I yeah, think I one think of the big problems that we have, too, with all of this is when you look at the way that relics have been treated throughout the history of Christendom, especially with the Roman Catholic Church, what you have is a very big issue of not just idolatry, but confusing them as a means of salvation. Right. Uh, so you, you have that great story of Martin Luther uh, crawling up on his hands and knees up the steps that they purported to have led. Was it Jesus up or they led uh, Pontius Pilate up? I forget the full story, but um, he crawls up on his hands and knees, kissing the steps and hoping that this is going to uh, help him and help a departed loved one to be freed from purgatory, which we don't believe in. But he gets to the top having, you know, crawled through the whole thing and then looks around and says, well, who knows if that actually worked? Yeah, the physical so, element itself communicating grace to the one that's participating in it or encountering. That's right. yep. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's a big dynamic a difference between Catholic and Protestant understanding of, I mean, even the physical world, right? Uh, that if there is any spiritual communication through even the elements of the Lord's Supper, right? That's obviously kind of a key conversation point is what, what what's the effectiveness in, right? Obviously, uh, Westminster talks about you know, it's the reception through faith, right, being the means by anything communicated rather than the elements themselves apart from faith, um, receiving blessing. I do want to focus in on the kind of relic portion of it, um, because I, I do think that's kind of a, a key concept here. So, for instance, I've been reading a book, Defenders of the West. Um, I think it's Raymond Ibrahim who talks about the Crusades and talking about the fight for the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, right, which is um, the historical and traditional spot of the uh, Lord's crucifixion in Jerusalem, and how they want to reclaim that, because it's an important historical location um, for the church and Christians. And I do think, as Josh said, there is some importance of honoring, I mean, historical locations. Our Bible is not a fiction. It is not a false myth. It is a, as Lewis would say, a true myth where these things actually happen. And by being true, um, we realize that these truths aren't spiritualized heavenly things, but I've come to this earth. And I think that's an important part of our religion, that it is a historical true thing. And so how do we balance caring about the historical and physical realities of our faith while also not getting into this weird superstition and mysticism that I think traps a lot of Christians? Well, I think one of the things we can look at is the way people treat the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, I mean, that, you know, we even call it the Holy Land experience because how wonderful it is to go and, and walk these locations. And there's, there is, I think, a truth to that, right? So Christianity recognizes that what we're looking at here is historical things that actually happened where God communicated with his people in this physical realm. Jesus walked this earth physically. So it makes sense that there would be relics of some sort or another. It makes sense that there would be archaeological discoveries. But like Josh was saying earlier, these things actually shouldn't be increasing our faith. Rather, we should see them and go, yeah, well, that, that makes sense. I mean, the Bible said it, so it's true. Regardless of whether or not we find anything at all, the, the Bible says it. There you go. So I think there's the one sense in which we have to look at these things and say, yes, history, uh, God communicated with us upon this earth. There's going to be some sort of physical elements here, whether it be relics or physical locations. But I think, again, we need to be careful that we, we don't treat either the relics or the locations themselves as being especially holy or and somehow contributing to our salvation. You know, if we're able to go walk in the Jordan or float in the Dead Sea. I don't think those things are going to make us holier than other Christians. Rather, we recognize, again, they're historical. It has a historical significance and importance. We praise God for it, but we recognize these things are not imparting really any sort of grace to us at all. Yeah, and and without neglecting the importance, right? Because because so much of this, you know, like just to do the, like two ditches on either side of the road. So you think back to, for example, with like Naaman being healed, um, Naaman's washed in the river. He comes over and asks for some, you know, dirt to take back with him. And uh, it seems like the implication there is he thinks that that uh, Yahweh is this territorial spirit and that he needs to get some of the land to bring back because this God that has healed him is, is somehow anchored to the land. So we see that we say, okay, well, you know, God is not bound to the land. There's nothing of the temple of the Holy Sepulcher, for example, that like binds God to it. There, there's nothing inherently there. The flip side, I think, on, on the other side of the ditch is to pretend like God doesn't care about the things he's made and the locations in which he has done stuff. You think of the triumphal entry. 
could Jesus have just been like, you know, it's going to be fine. I'm, I'm just going to go into the city down the road. Jerusalem's too hot. It's going to be fine here. No, like he, he said he was going to go to Jerusalem, this fulfilled prophecy. This the, 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 There was something about the place itself that was actually meaningful. I think Christians can preserve that. You know, John, you brought up the Lord's Supper earlier. I think most of us would say um, that when, when Christians gather on the Lord's Day and separate the Lord's table and take communion with one another, that we're not we're not creating something that is just uh, ontologically different than uh, than when we do family worship or something like that at home. But we would all confess it is special. You know, you, you cited Westminster and Westminster would recognize there, there's something actually inherently blessed about that time and that place um, that God actually says he works through the the administration of the uh, the sacraments to his people. So I think just avoiding those ditches maybe and saying uh, the place does actually matter. The things do matter, but we don't want to overbalance those and become pagan in our thinking and, and ascribe something that God would not have us do to them. Yeah, and I think as we get into this, uh, one place this gets very interesting is the use of relics, and not just relics, but images. Um, images is a big part of Catholic doctrine, uh, icons, and um, images even of Christ. And this gets into a conversation around Second Commandment violations. And I just want to read a portion of the Westminster Larger Catechism where it addresses this topic. Question 109, what sins are forbidden in the Second Commandment? The sins forbidden in the second commandment are all devising, counseling, commanding, using, and any wise approving any religious worship not instituted by God himself. The making any representation of God, of all or any of the three persons, either inwardly in our mind or outwardly in any kind of image or likeness of any creature whatsoever. All worshiping of it or God in it or by it. So with the Shroud of Turin, with new technology, specifically using artificial intelligence, uh, 3D rendering, and being able to draw an image from incomplete data, uh, we've seen on Twitter um, depictions of using the Shroud of Turin. What would Jesus, or so to speak, Jesus look like um, in kind of a photorealistic example? Yeah. We also have seen 3D rendered models of what his body would look like. As Christians, should we be wary of such uses of technology to try to image uh the person of christ yes yeah and here's one of the primary reasons why As jake we... and i are both just itching at the reins to get in on this one go ahead jake yeah so let let me let me just tackle it this way first uh so first of all i looked at the images um probably shouldn't have so you know don't look at them but anyway they depict jesus as having had long hair which we know he wasn't a Nazarite. People often get confused about that, by the way. He was Nazarene, not not a Nazarite. Uh, and the reason we know that he wasn't a Nazarite is because he regularly drank wine, and we see him often going to dead bodies. And it seems like he's able to easily blend in with crowds when he so desires. Now, of course, he can perform miracles like that, but it seems as though he would have had relatively short hair. But the other issue with it is it depicts him as having a beard, and that beard really doesn't look like there's too much wrong with it. And just as an example, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. So we know that one of the things going on when Jesus was being crucified is they were, whether they pulled out the entire beard or just parts of the beard, this this image that has been created really does not seem to depict who Jesus truly was according to scripture. Now, again, we need to be careful here because one of the things we're being particularly warned about in the second commandment is not to create any graven images. And this seems to me to be a primary case of a graven image that has been created. Whether or not it's true, it's still a second commandment violation. And I know Josh wants to say stuff too. So go ahead, Josh. Yeah, no, you're you're covering a lot of it, honestly. It's and just to just to read um from from the prohibition, at least the as it's listed in Exodus 20. Um, Exodus 20 says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I the Lord, your Lord, uh, your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. And then you have the warning that that comes after. So cr Christians have gone back and forth on does this say not to make any image um, of the Lord or of, you know, maybe possibly even angelic beings, or is this just saying don't worship those images? I'm I'm one of those, and I think I think Jake, you were uh, saying the same thing. Um, I'm convinced that it's saying don't make the image itself. Um, I think that's why you have the prohibition against the image followed by the prohibition not to worship it. But either way, when you see the image of of Christ 
as, as they're trying to depict it from AI generated software, and then people are sharing it online. Um, I would just ask of the Christian, what is the image to convey? So, so if you were to see a, pi a picture, let's just assume the, the, the Shroud of Turin is real, because I think this cuts at the heart of why Second Commandment violations are kind of a tricky business, but an important business. If if the Shroud is real, let's let's say, and that is actually an accurate AI-generated representation of our Lord and Savior as he walked in the flesh, what is the only response of the Christian's heart to that image? It would be one of worship and veneration. You you could not look upon the Lord without a sense of worship and veneration. I think that's why the second commandment violation is there. I think that's why that prohibition rather is there for us not to try to generate those images because when you see it, you should either scoff and say that is not actually my Lord and Savior or you should worship because this is our Lord and Savior. And I think that's why Christ um, has those commandments for our own good and uh, for the guarding of our hearts. I think the other thing, too, we got to keep in mind here is that when God created man and woman, he created them what? In his own likeness, in his own image. So effectively, what God has done is he has created us to be his image bearers here upon this earth. And so to cr try to, to recreate something is really to try, I think, to to play the role of God. And it doesn't even, it, it, yes, it could lead into worship. And I think you're exactly right there. But I think the other big issue here, and man, we could talk a long time about the issues with AI and everything else. But I think what it does is it puts us into that position to believe that we are somehow God. Uh, or or it creates this this idol factory where we're constantly creating more and more idols to fall down and worship, whether it be relics or historical locations, or like you were saying, if the shroud is real and this is really Jesus, then again, it creates this desire within our hearts to worship these things. And that is a very, very dangerous path to be on. Yeah. And I think Jacob, your whole point, I think, leads really well into what I want to talk about next. Because when we talk about Second Commandment violations, almost akin to Jesus' response about um, paying taxes and render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God, a key uh, point in that whole conversation is that Jesus says whose image or likeness is on this coin. And then the logical conclusion is, well, Who's where's the image of God and it's placed on each person. And so Jesus is heightening the requirement that we must have to render our very own persons to God, because that's where God has placed his image. So if there is going to be an image of God, we are seeking, well, God has established that in persons. And by doing that, uh, we, we see that one of the greatest violations, I would argue of the second commandment uh, would be a destruction of the image that God has appointed, which would be obviously murder, which is covered in the sixth commandment. And right now in our culture, that debate is really kind of a focal point for the political realm. And this gets into our next story um, around ab abortion and specifically how the right and the Republicans are responding to that. We've seen this past week, both uh, pre former President Donald Trump and uh, J.D. Vance give specific and uh, I would say, discouraging comments about abortion. Uh, here's a video about J.D. Vance. Can you commit, Senator, sitting right here with me today, that if you and Donald Trump are elected, that you will not impose a federal ban on abortion? I can absolutely commit that, Kristen. And Donald Trump has been as clear about that as possible. I, I think it's important to step back and say, what has Donald Trump actually said on the abortion question? And how is it different from what Kamala Harris and the Democrats have said? Donald Trump wants to end this culture war over this particular topic. And Donald Trump also posted on Truth Social this. My administration will be great for women and their reproductive rights. So as Christians interacting with politics, uh, we, we must do that. We are obviously political creatures in America. How should we respond to conversations and comments like this um, from people on the right as Republicans are seeming to, whether some tricky political tactic for the chess going on, um, they seem to be using the same language as the left. I think as Christians, we need to push back on this. Josh, Jacob, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was it was sad to see that. I think I think two things that I thought when I saw the video, though, was number one, I've heard, I've heard some people say that uh, Trump is 
angling in Vance or angling more for a state's rights decision making process when it comes to these things. So I think many of us could say that there is good biblical precedent for a limited government, uh, perhaps one that does not have overarching authority over things like abortion, and that that should be an issue that's, uh, you know, cast down to the states or, you know, rightfully delegated maybe even to the states. Um, that's an interesting thing to walk through. That's a little bit more political science than it is uh, biblical theology, but I understand the argument there. Um, on the flip side, on the flip side of that, it seems like a very politically advantageous move. Um, and I think it's easy enough to just leave that right there. This is something, um, this is something that does in, in, you know, ostensibly win votes with maybe some of the middles or even progressives within our country. Um, those of us who are on the, uh, conservative, the, the far conservative, uh, swing of things are, are, are left with few candidates to choose from. So at, at its surface level, it just looks politically advantageous. But in any case, I would add this at the end, and this just, this isn't just a platitude. Um, I think it is a travesty uh, that we're at this place in our country. Amen. That's absolutely true. And again, this is one of those situations where we look at what Trump is doing and what Vance is saying in the clip, what Trump is saying in the tweet or whatever, whatever we call that. And we have to we have to remember that, of course, politicians never lie. They're always telling the truth. Number one. Number two, because it is politically advantageous for them to to say this. The sad thing is, is that we really don't know what they're thinking, but abortion is murder. And so despite all of the different comments and all of the different things we could say about it, this is still the killing of innocent children, innocent babies that we're talking about here, lives created in the image of God. And so the fact that Vance would say what he says, and Trump would even adopt this language of, help me out here again, John, how did he word it? That this is going to be great for women's hey. reproductive rights. Is that right? That's correct. So this is, again, leftist language being adopted, being co-opted by the right and this is, again, one of my big concerns, because I've been saying now for a while that the Republican Party as it exists today is the Democratic Party of 15 years ago, maybe, you know, maybe even less than that, because we, we seem to be on this downward spiral where it's it, conservatism used to be about conserving principles and values. It was grounded in Christianity. But now conservatism, conservatism seems to just simply be how how much can we progress forward like the left but do it slowly do it by increments and that to me is incredibly incredibly concerning and again i'm not sure where that really leaves christians in america i've been advocating for a christian party for a while so four years from now josh is going to be running for president and we can all vote for him uh but until then we we are going to have to make a decision this election season and you know this this is why more than likely i'm going to vote for trump again i'm definitely not voting for harris and the reason is because again you you go back to these single issues of abortion or gay marriage or whatever have you these things matter they're important and if either either we're going to stand upon what scripture says and we're going to obey god or we're going to incrementally begin to slip and sin against his word more and more and more. And this is where we need to not only be praying, but I think we need to be acting and we need to act first within our communities, right? Within our homes, within our churches. But then that activity needs to spread out further and further. So I don't know how we get a Christian party going that actually is going to have a shot at this thing. But I think we we got to start doing something. Well, I think this goes to the whole conversation around things like the Overton window, acceptable discourse. And I think this is where Christians need to respond. So there's a concept, obviously, we've talked about on the show before, no enemies to the right. And the logic is, hey, if we're all fighting the same enemy, we shouldn't be bickering and creating difficulties in our own camps. But this to me is an example of where no enemies to the right should apply, where if someone's leaning leftward, if they're using leftward language, then we need to punch them to the right, right? This isn't me saying, oh, Donald Trump, oh, no enemies to the right, we shouldn't speak harshly. Just like the left police is their own, when Joe Biden or whomever would give a comment that goes against the leftist agenda, they would punch in that direction because they want to make the party further left. As Christians, we want a clear Christian principle to be dominating um, our candidates. 
And so when someone like Donald Trump or J.D. Vance says something that it goes against our convictions, then we should make a stink about this. Uh, as we read even in the uh, Westminster Larger Catechism about Second Commandment violations, I think there is a broader principle that the disapproving, detesting, opposing, according to each one's place and calling, that this should be removed and uh, confronted. I think that applies to all sins. If there is a sin going on publicly, and I have the place and position to respond to it, then we, I think, have a duty. I feel like it is almost a sin of um, omission for me not to say something against it. Um, obviously, with America and the freedoms that we have, um, places like Twitter, I think it's important that Christians do push back against this. So there is obviously the kind of like white evangelical voting block that's talked about so often in politics that if there's a clear, loud voice against this, I believe, you know, guys like J.D. Vance and Trump are a little bit populist where they kind of see where the flow of conversation discourse is. The more we push back against this, the more we'll see that shift in politics. And again, I think this goes back to the heart of if I think there's one thing in the reform record I want to keep pushing is really your greatest area of influence is your own sphere. Right. So your family, your church, your uh, local city and even your workplace all of those places, if our, we're able to speak against evil, that's going to push that little cultural bubble that you're in a little further in the right direction. And I think it's that the left has been so good at making a stink and being loud about this that less than 5% of the population, if you look at America being kind of gay and pro-trans, how much of the population really is that supporting? It's such a minority. But think about the Christian culture in America, whether they're really elect and saved. I'm saying those who would say they're on the Christian side of things. If we really rally that group, man, what good could we see for the culture? I think it's that Christians sometimes say, well, the world, that's just how it is. But as Christians, we need to push back. And I think making a strong statement against this, saying that this is despicable. How dare Donald Trump and J.D. Vance say such things that we as Christians are completely against this and we oppose him in this. Um, then we could get to the tactics of it's still politics and we may still have to play the game, but we want to make sure that this is something that we are actively, consciously, verbally pushing back against. And I think John, that's something Christians need to use their voice for. Let me let me add on that too, brother, because because I, I think and I don't have a great term for this. Um, we need to coin one. But, uh, you know, you talked about the Overton window of, you know, acceptable political discourse. What, what's been on my mind a lot with this current electoral cycle is that kind of window of God's judgment upon a people. Um, so this would be sort of, I think, I think the biblical outworking of what you're talking about with the Overton window, because essentially Overton window is talking about what is politically uh, acceptable within, you know, modern parlance or discourse. This is what people think is okay to consider. What What is on my mind is when you read the biblical narrative, and I'm specifically thinking like the book of Judges or any, any number of times where you see widespread judgment upon God's people because of sins that he says have risen to his nostrils and are heinous in his sight, you know, such as the degradation of their culture. Every electoral cycle, we hear things like, don't be a single issue voter, uh, or you hear things like, uh, we can certainly support a candidate or, dare I say, a political party, uh, despite the, the stance they've taken on just this issue of abortion. Number one, we should remember that the, the widespread proliferation of abortion is a, is, a, is a newer development within Western civilization. This has not always been the case. It has been within many of our lifetimes, but this is not just some sort of constant that is held throughout history. But secondly... Even if it were, if we were to look at God's judgment upon a people, um, at, at what point does God bring judgment on a nation, on a people, on a party, um, whatever that looks like? Wh when I look at this window, it is very troubling to me that so many even believers are approaching this issue and saying, yes, I know that candidate party, you know, fill in the blank. I know they support abortion and yet look at the good that could be done. Now, you can push back and say, if all the good viable candidates are supporting abortion, what am I to do? I understand there's conversation to be had there, but what we can't do, and this is what I think you were keying in on, John, is act as if that is okay. Uh, not let our voice be heard. If you have to, um, if you find if you find yourself in the place where you feel biblically warranted to vote for a candidate who has made some waffles concerning abortion, made a little bit of made a little bit of a, a stagger in their footsteps when it came to opposing abortion as they had in the past, and you vote for that candidate, 
you must not remain silent about the abortion issue. That must be something that you're championing because what is, what is very pressing on my mind pastorally um, and as a theologian who just tries to study God's word and sees how God brings judgment righteously and justly upon people is that we are so used to this travesty and this this genocide of our young ones that's occurring within our culture that we, we see it as a policy point. And especially our younger generations see this as some sort of box to be checked within a policy platform as opposed to a gross and heinous sin before a holy God who has stamped those children with his very image. So for Christians, that would be my plea in the midst of this. Don't let the reality of what we're talking about be lost within who are you going to cast your vote for in the ballot box. There's something far greater at work here. We yeah. also need to keep in mind with all of this, if you or I or any Christian listening to this were somehow placed within the Oval Office and there came a bill across our desk that said, we're going to abolish abortion nationwide, it's now illegal, what Christian wouldn't want to immediately sign that bill? I mean, get rid of all the political theory, get rid of everything else, get rid of state rights, all of those different things. If you had the opportunity to end abortion in America and you didn't want to take it, I think that says everything it needs to yeah. it needs to say. Yeah, and this, so no, we can't the, be silent. This is the Christian. This is the Christian in the Third Reich having that bill come before him and say, "We're going to stop killing Jewish people." And he says, "Well, you know, I've got you know di different municipalities within the German Empire that I need to." No, of course you would sign that. Evil is being uh, being perpetrated. We must we must stop this heinous evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I think the left is so shrewd in, and Jesus even makes this point in the Gospels, right? That the the sons of darkness are sometimes better and shrewder and wiser about handling this world than the sons of light. And I think as Christians, yes, right, there might be some political strategizing, but I think this inside-outside game is so important where there may be political strategies here and there, but we need to be as explicit as possible that there is sin, right? There is the justice of God. There's the law of God. And I think if we say, oh, well, we're trying to be political. To me, it's the same thing that, you know, the tactical Christian evangelists kind of speak about like, oh, I need to build a relationship first. I need to do all this. And it's really, they hide behind tactics to never actually share the gospel with their coworkers because they're afraid of the implications and downstream effects of this. I sometimes see Christians speak this way of, oh, well, we can't speak too openly against Donald Trump's proclamations or what's going on in the right part um on you know on the right because that could weaken our political stance and, and to me is yes there is tactics yes there is prudence in all of these things and i think there's a lot smarter people talking about this than me but at the end of the day there is the law of god and i think we need to be as clear and ex explicit as possible about saying what is the law of god now how do we get from a to b Sure, we talk tactics there, but if Christians aren't actively saying, this is evil, this is evil, this is evil, I mean, the most obvious thing is, if you bring peace to an evil man, he's not going to be satisfied. He's going to push. I mean, the leech says more and more, as it says in Proverbs. In the same way, we have to fight back against evil by um, conquering, destroying it. Second Corinthians 10 makes it clear that we fight against thoughts and institutions and ideas to bring every thought obedient to Christ. And so that's why I want to leave us with, if we are going to be strict about second commandment violations, I get we want to get on the Catholic church. I get we want to get on the local non-denominational church that uses Jesus in their kids' ministry. But if there's really any violation of destroying and perverting the image of God, how is abortion not one of them that we're loudly fighting against? So that's the Reformed Reckoner. As always, be steadfast, immovable, and always abound in the work of the Lord. We'll see you next week. At my right hand, the Lord to my Lord did command for all these ye that I will make a kingly footstool for your sake. And if you have kids, go and baptize them. <laughs> <laughs> there's my there's my outro. <laughs>